well, we can probably get started. Um, so I'll kick us off. This is the Calico community meeting for August 11th, 2021. Um, before I get going, could I get a volunteer to take some notes for me? Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Casey, if you want to throw me the link. Yes. chat. We've got all of our minutes. Thank you. Cut off the J in July. I'll fix that. Um, and anybody can feel free to throw in and augment those notes. I should be open. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start off just by giving a quick rundown on uh, release work. So um, we just recently released Calico 3.20. That came out uh, July 30th, um, so a couple of weeks ago now. Um, it had a bunch of stuff in it, but a few notable things. Um, we did some improvement to our IPAM garbage collection uh, capabilities. So uh, we added some, some more general purpose IP address collection that will uh, detect when it thinks addresses no longer belong to um, a pod or, or you know, are no longer in use, um, and we'll release those. Uh, this is good for catching stuff like um, when nodes are brought down in a non-graceful way. Um, normally, we expect the CNI plugin to release those, but sometimes you can. Uh, kill a node, for example, without giving the CNI plugin a chance to run. Um, we also um, updated that controller so that it will release uh, blocks that are no longer in use on a node. So if you've got, um, say, like really bursty um, bouts of pods where your, your nodes go from having a uh, large number of pods to a small number will uh, reclaim those blocks after the burst is over uh, so they can be used elsewhere. Uh, so those are both pretty cool. We um, also added the ability during a rolling update to prevent scheduling of pods to nodes that are um, being updated. Uh, so that's uh, hopefully a nice little stability improvement. Um, kind of closes a window where a pod might get scheduled, but doesn't get uh, networking applied to it for a few seconds. Um, we've got new support for configuring the BGP graceful restart timer. I think for most folks, you shouldn't need to touch that, but uh, sometimes, depending on your environment, you may want that to be longer or shorter. Um, so that's available now. Uh, the eBPF data plane now supports uh, XDP um, rules. Uh, so that's something we've had in, in IP tables mode for a little while. And uh, we'll now render some rules into XDP um, pretty early in the data path. Uh, and then we've also got something that I'm going to demo a little bit later, which is um, kind of a, a first step towards implementing policy rules based on Kubernetes services. Um, so in 3.20, we've got uh, support for egress rules, and we'll be looking to expand that in 3.21. Uh, we've also introduced a uh, new repo for uh, Golang API. So if you're um, looking to do some development against the Calico API, you've now got Golang bindings and clients uh, for that. Um, so that's pretty cool. Excited to see uh, that start to get some use. 
Uh, what else? Uh, oh, we um, yeah, we published our Helm chart uh, finally to a public index, so um, we can get that using normal um, Helm commands now, rather than going to our releases page and downloading the uh, zip by hand. Um, and we've extended WireGuard support for uh, AKS when you're using the Azure CNI plugin. I think that's all the big stuff. There's uh, quite a bit there. Um, it's a pretty, pretty big release. Uh, anybody spot anything I missed or have any questions on any of that? I know we went over it pretty quick. All right, there, there is one thing that's, uh, I guess it's with the operator uh, that we changed that, wait, right? Yeah, API registration uh, was bumped to V1 instead of V1 beta uh, for Kubernetes compatibility. And I'm pretty sure that was, that came out with the 320 release. Right. Um... So that's they've removed that API, I guess. In yeah, uh, I think I, yeah, I think it's removed in twenty two, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think so. Do you know when the V one API was introduced? Yeah, it's been there since one dot ten. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it shouldn't really have any compatibility impacts unless somebody's yeah. still using 110. Yeah, no, hopefully just some <laughs> no more uh, deprecation warnings <laughs> yeah. for that. Cool. That's good to know. Just, just curious about the BGP restart, whether people were looking for that and what kind of use case or anything is. Um, we did have uh, at least one user looking for it. I think in their environment, um, it sometimes they're running at a pretty large scale, and uh, they would see that nodes would sometimes be down for longer than the graceful restart time during a rolling update, just due to general control plane load. Um, and so they wanted to keep routes intact. It actually is. Um, Paired pretty nicely with the other one I mentioned, which is the uh, prevent scheduling of pods to nodes that don't have Calico node running. Um, so, like by default, I think the BGP graceful restart timer is 90 seconds, or uh, if I recall correctly. Um, so, if your node takes two minutes, for example, you want to um, one not withdraw the routes for running pods, and two not schedule anything new there because you won't be able to um, network those properly. Yeah, I don't think the graceful restart timer was designed with Kubernetes in mind. In fact, you know, it was probably designed 30 years ago. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, those two kind of go together to, to make that sort of thing a little nicer. Uh, but like I said, unless you're like seeing uh, your rolling updates take that long, um, you probably don't need to toggle that setting. Uh, and it's um, it's specifically the time the time during the rolling update where Calico node is actually like down and not running. So once we start running and um, connecting to BGP and everything, it's it's kind of okay. So we, we our pods don't usually come ready for 30 seconds or more. That's sort of deliberate, but it's not waiting for them to be ready. It's waiting for waiting for sort of the initial start and sync of the of the BGP peers. Yeah, that's right. So usually like in a normal healthy cluster, that's like one to two seconds. 
that uh, one to two seconds can always be stretched out if you have something heavily loaded. Nathan, did you have anything you wanted to talk about on uh, VPP? Mm -hmm. Maybe a quick update on this, what we've been at recently. Um, <clears throat> there were a few updates on AWS uh, interrupt mode, trying to make it uh, work smoother. Um, and we we are still working. So the, the things we are working on currently, uh, there is AKS support that we are aiming at. Um, mm -hmm. And we're also targeting uh, being able to configure multiple interfaces uh, inside VPP. Um, there is also some, some effort to integrate the MEMFs and the VCR, so being able to, to use a VPP dedicated host stack and packet oriented interfaces. Uh, and obviously, we'll try to, as soon as possible, to, to publish a 3.20 release for Calico VPP. Uh, also, we should uh, release this in PTO today, but we should have uh, something hopefully by next week. Nice. I saw your uh, Raul Luis's um, PRs for the host port work as well. Mm. Um, yeah, I think. Hopefully, uh, we can progress that a little bit in 321. Mm. I think it's uh, and everybody's interest to move off of the host port CNI plugin across all data planes mm -hmm. anyway. Yes. Nathan, I was having a lot of trouble hearing you. You had a lot of boom on your mic, so I didn't really manage to catch the notes there, I'm afraid. Um, I don't yeah. think read it at the dock and quickly put a couple of bullets in there. That'd be great. Okay. Sorry for the, for the sound if it was terrible. No, 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 it's fine. I just, yeah. Uh, I was just... uh, I'll fill that in. Thanks. Um, Eric, I know you mentioned the API registration stuff. Is there anything else in install and operator? Um, uh, not too much. There was the, there's been uh, a little bit of chatter about the um, uh, priority class um, that we use uh, with the operator. Uh, when we originally did the operator, it wasn't possible to use the um, the system critical uh, classes. That's system node critical and system cluster critical uh, in any namespaces other than kube system. Uh, so we created um, the operator creates one that's as high as you can go for a user. Um, but since Kubernetes 117, that restriction to Kube system namespace only uh, has been removed, so um, uh, that's something that we could could do to switch to use those to ensure that like Node and uh, Typha and Kube controllers um, are higher priority than uh, you know standard uh, user um, pods uh, to ensure they get scheduled. Um, I'm not working on it right now. Uh, one of the people that submitted an uh, issue on the operator repo, uh, I think he uh, has uh, suggested that he, he is going to try to submit a PR for that. Um, and I checked internally and relayed it to him that um, in the in the bug that uh, we don't need to maintain the um, uh, compatibility with 1.16 uh, for new operator releases. So uh, there's no worry to keep the existing and do like a version switch or something on that. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that was the only other thing I had besides API registration. Do you know, um, I just realized I wasn't sure, are those only used for scheduling or are they also part of uh, like the eviction decision? Um, I think they're part of the eviction uh, only because I think that was why they were wanting them bumped <laughs> up uh -huh. to the to the system critical uh, because they were saying that like Typha or something was getting, I think it was Typha was getting 
evicted or yeah does that mean that whoever was running the cluster had set their workload to be system critical above yes. typer like yeah, yeah it's a bit of an arms race <laughs> yeah 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 well i i think so i think what they were doing i think what i remember is that they were using system cluster critical and had a bunch of stuff set to that so actually i think it was node getting evicted because if node had had system node critical then it would have stayed but since it was uh lower priority than system cluster critical it got ejected so yeah yeah it seemed like the nodes might have been a little loaded <laughs> But I, I think it's good that I think we should switch. There's no reason not to now. So yeah, I, I think that's all I've got for the operator. Cool, thanks, Eric. Um, <laughs> any other updates or thoughts for this, this section of the meeting? not um we'll talk about some hot issues so uh i got one um sort of nice update which is that uh, uh pretty pretty hot topic recently has been this issue around um, loss of connectivity during termination grace period and you're using uh calico for policy with non calico uh, cni plugins um, I think the most uh, discussed one has been around the EKS CNI. Yep, Sean knows all about that one. He uh, a big part of that. Uh, my only. Yeah, I, I introduced that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was in uh, in fixing something else, right? Uh, yeah. So that one, um, the fix is in. It's in three twenty. And it's also been backported with 319. Um, and we've just got a patch release out for that earlier this week. Um, so if you're encountering that, uh, you've got a couple options in terms of upgrade. Um, I think we've also backported it to 318 and 317, um, but release plans for those are a little bit less clear. So it'll eventually make it into, into one of those patch releases, but uh, I don't think we have any of those coming up in the next week or so. I think the main issue we have there is um, the uh, a lot of people are hitting it are using the AWS package version of Calico with EKS. And that's still on whatever release it's on and needs to be updated. So yeah. it takes a little while to get that to flow through. I was just going to say something about that, that we need to get that updated. Yeah, because there, Casey, that PR that I think you were aware of on AWS switch, you know, where they were updating like all the, so that they'll have uh, the charts updated. Somebody commented about that, actually that change introducing this bug because the charts were on a version even older that didn't have that bug yet. Right. So, yeah. yeah and actually, out. actually, with that charts update, it hopefully will be easier, maybe, to do the upgrade. Be nice. Yeah, let's remember to, to hop on to that PR and say it's released now. Yeah. Casey, I think we may have said on um, Calico users that that backport was going to go back to 316. Hmm. Um, I can follow up on that. I think we only did it back to 317. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think maybe we should follow up on that. Um, can you let me know? Uh, I know of at least one person who asked, would it go back to 316? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I generally like to nudge that. people who are on 3.1, 3.2, 3.4 to upgrade. And, yeah. yeah. 316 right. is getting a little long in the tooth. Um, do, 
Sean, do you remember what release this was introduced in? Was it was it in three sixteen? I think it was three sixteen. Yeah, the AWS chart was on three fifteen, and so it didn't have it. But yeah, anything after it would. Yeah. Notionally, we only tried to backport one or two releases, a couple of releases usually. Um, but sometimes we go further if it's a particularly heinous issue or uh, there's kind of customer pressure for some reason. So what you're saying is I can't have the fix for my Amiga 500? Yeah, pretty much. Um, any other issues that we should uh, chat about? And if not, then we can move on and uh, nominate some heroes. If anybody's uh, noticed some, some cool oh, Jay, stuff. didn't you? Jay, you put a you put an issue in. Did you want to? Did you want to elaborate on that? Oh yeah, just a general question. We um, so we have been playing around with. Um, we have this these Windows Dev Tools, and we've got um, Calico in there. And um, in general, uh, a couple of questions. One is, and some of these are kind of dumb questions, but like, uh, so like the first question is. Um, when you're, when you're debugging Calico on BGP versus VXLAN, um, like what are the differences? Um, like what are the things that we should look out for as we start to start to compare them? Because for these dev tools, we don't really want to use BGP because you have to run a service to do that on windows. Whereas I think you get VXLAN for free or you do. I, so that like one of the questions I had was like, well, what are the trade-offs on a development environment in terms of being able to debug how stuff is working? I know you have like the liveness checks for Calico Bird and all that. There might, there's probably better tools for inspecting whether BGP is working than VXLAN, but I don't know enough about the difference between BGP and VXLAN to know the difference. I, I would say for a dev cluster, you want to be on uh, VXLAN. Um, okay. Just because, well, VXLAN is an overlay so it's going to work in you know more scenarios and you don't need to worry about pairing with your fabric bgp support on windows is um it's kind of basic bgp uh, it doesn't support the the um ipip um modification that we have on linux if i remember correctly so the bgp support is really but if you if you're ready to peer with your fabric and you want and you're running a BGP network, then you can do that. Um, or or if everything's running in one big subnet, you can use BGP mode to um, to span the subnet. But I think for most most cases, you want to be on VXLAN. Um, Even in production. Uh, well, I mean, that, that depends what environment you're running in in production. So if you're in the yeah. cloud, then you probably don't have anything to, to peer with um, over BGP. So you probably want to be running the then anyway. Anyways, if yeah. If you're on-prem on and you're at liberty to kind of build your network around, around Calico, then peering with your top of racks is a nice way to, to get a very efficient network with you know, low, low complexity. Okay. The top of rack thing is, can you elaborate what you mean by on, on that side? Um, so I, I think we've got some, some examples, some explanation of uh, this sort of stuff in the docs, but um, yeah. if you, if you're building out your own network, um, there's lots of different ways to build out a data center network. They're really common um, or a common way to, to do it is um, you have a rack of servers, each rack of servers has one or two top of rack um, routers. Um, and then each of your physical servers is physically connected to your one or two routers with 
an Ethernet cable, and then um, you can run BGP on the top of RAP, peer each node gotcha. in the RAP with okay. the top of RAP router. So each node can advertise out the routes that it knows, um, i.e. the local pods that it, that it has access to. Um, and then you don't need to peer any of the Calico nodes with each other because they're all peering with the top of rack and the top of rack will advertise down the routes to the nodes, putting itself as the next hop. So every, everything in that rack will go via the top of rack and the top of rack will um, advertise the routes that are okay. within it rack out into the spine of the network. Yep. Um, I, I never understood the Calico top of rack thing with BGP. Now I understand it. Thanks a lot. That helps a lot. Yep. Okay. You can so also yeah. advertise service IPs and stuff over over that. Um, so as an alternative to using like an ingress or something. Yeah. Oh. Like, for like real simple thing is like BGP's main purpose is integrating with external devices that also yeah. speak it. Um, so if you're running in AWS or like local kind cluster or something like that. There's not a whole lot of reason for it unless you're specifically trying to test BGP itself. Um, cool. All right. Other than that, so VXLAN for dev and as far as the tooling and when we, all the rest of the CNI stuff works the same. So we should be able to still see, see the same stuff going on with routes and ethernet yeah. devices and stuff. It's pretty similar on Windows, but I, if I remember correctly, on Windows, um, like the underlying model on Windows is before you can connect pods to your network, you have to create a Windows like network object, which is backed, kind of hidden um, yeah. behind the scenes by a vSwitch. And the vSwitch is either in kind of ordinary mode or VXLAN mode at creation time. So they're kind of subtly different. Like if you're, if, uh, if VXLAN mode is enabled, you'll see some extra, um, some extra VXLAN related rules um, put into the, the policy tables of the vSwitch. Yeah. That's yeah, that is. Yeah. And so where this, where I was really going with all this, like is um, when we create those, when we create a windows cluster, when we create, well, when we, when we start Calico node and we, we enable the whole, um, you know, VXLAN mode thing properly inside of the windows service, when we start it, um, does the, like, does Cal like is there a way or should there be a way to pick the device that is being used um like for in like the like does the when you create a v the v switch it has to like attach to an actual real device as the uplink right and is there plumbing to do that? And should we be adding plumbing if there's not? Um, I think we 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 try to automatically set up everything that's needed when we create the create the V switch. Yeah, um, I I could believe that we don't um, have perfect support for multiple NICs and things like that. Um, so okay. If your host has loads of NICs and you're wanting to do something complicated, that might be something that we need to investigate. Certainly, when when we started with Windows, like the the APIs were fairly um, uh, like fairly basic, and there were several things that the the Windows team just told us, okay, you need to you need to make this API call and this API call and this API call to make make your network connected to the host. Um, mm -hmm. But the the kind of underlying model wasn't super clear, so. Um, if you're trying to do something more complicated, I think you might need to uh, take it offline and investigate it. Yeah, that's what, because in, you know, in VirtualBox, right, which is what we want to give people for developing Calico and upstream kube on Windows and hacking on the kube proxy. The issue is it always makes like a, it 
by default it like wants to make like an outgoing thing anybody that's ever run vagrant or you'll see it 10.0.2.15 and then it makes another nic for the private network and obviously for your kubelets you want to join on that private network but when you uplink to get out of the you know go to the internet or whatever you want to go to um you want to go through that 10.0.2.15 nic and so i think we have we're dealing with this in multiple places in Windows, right? Like we're dealing with it at the kubelet level because when the kubelet starts, it just guesses the, <laughs> it just like guesses the nick randomly on Windows. So like that's an issue. And then um, I think it's an issue. It's the CNI level. Um, I mean, it doesn't happen on typical VMs that you run in the cloud. So I guess that's why most people that are running Windows don't run into this problem. But in the specific case where you want to hack and you want to build dev environments yep. it becomes I, tricky i honestly can't remember if we have configuration for which nick we attach okay. um but um if not it's something that i think could be added cool well this right. is also that the, for, i'm sorry but, well this is also the concept of having dual nick support right so you can you can use two nicks because like you're talking about internal communications versus outgoing and we've we've had customers ask about that kind of feature too, right? And it's it's something we know that you don't support right now. And not actually there's, I think there's very few, if any, <laughs> CNIs that support a dual NIC configuration, right? I think uh, we support that kind of thing on Linux these days. And, you know, just if your roots are, roots are the right way, I think Calico Enterprise has some extra features for it, but that's, a, that's off topic for this meeting. Um, on Windows, I, I I think we can we could bind to one or another NIC uh, fairly easily. I don't know if the Windows fabric supports binding to multiple NICs and and sending the right traffic to the right one. Okay. Um, so what should we? What would be the? I guess the. Um, what's the? What should we do about? this is it something we should like file an issue on node and maybe ping song about it or should is it something that's probably you know, the right yeah. thing yeah if there's not an okay. issue open on node already open one there you can ping song you can also send it to me on slack cool um, just so i don't lose track of it and then um yeah we'll we'll uh finish our discussion there really quickly how do you all test windows for calico right now um do you use local virtual machines or do you do it all in the cloud it's all in the cloud okay a bit of both i think doesn't i think uh i have spun up a local virtual machine in the past I think I'm uh, but yeah most mostly in the cloud yeah yeah like the automated testing obviously is all in the cloud Just have to say, I'm a little distracted. There's large tree branches falling directly in front of my window this whole time. It's got me kind of excited because there's a big tree next door that blocks all of our light, and I think that's where they're coming from. So this is like Christmas. As long as they're coming down in a controlled way. <laughs> yeah, they're so, crashing down or are they being cut down? <laughs> I think they're being cut. That's my hope. You do your life insurance just quickly, though. Is it because of the fires, Casey? Is the tree uh, on fire? <laughs> is, the, is, the, is it that they're like flaming branches yep, falling? Big balls of fire, flaming tree branches uh, falling in front of me. But at least I'll get some of the sunlight. Um, where were we? Casey, we're... Casey missed the evac notice. I <laughs> know <laughs> I'm the only one left in the city. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, do we have any uh, shout outs we wanted to do today? Yeah, there's a um, so Joachim um, Chaka, I think is his last name, works for DGraph, has been producing some really nice blog posts uh, involving, I guess he's been looking at 
at AKS and just getting people bootstrapped on that and stuff. And uh, um, it's really nice. He's got all, all sorts of you know references out and for tools and everything. And just really nicely done. some get blog posts and if you have links to those you could check them in the um, chat or the meeting notes yeah I'll hold if you can I have one in the meeting notes but he's actually published like at least three I had a shout out um someone help me with the um stateful sets and graceful restart sorry not graceful restart graceful termination um issues so mark kindus um just um uh it was a like just an absolute pleasure to work with in that he came with an issue brought all the diags and suggested a solution and it was all just like there on a plate to go away and uh, uh figure out exactly what was wrong instead of spending uh, a long time digging into it can you put his surname in the, in the doc please um i didn't catch it what was that uh, stateful set issue yeah stateful set issue kind of related to related to the graceful termination um yeah that that piece of work that i did a while back um just keeps giving and giving in terms of um corner cases and issues but hopefully we've got them all now Um, so the the issue there was if you had a stateful set, sometimes um, uh, after restarting one of the nodes, um, it would get into a state where we'd um, we'd remove its networking immediately when the node was terminated instead of waiting for the graceful termination period, um, and that was even with the other fix, um, it would still hit that problem. It's like stateful sets are like the, so in all of our CI jobs, I changed all of our CI jobs to not run unless the stateful set tests pass first, because uh, I'm like, that's the thing that never works. It's like, it's like, it's they, like, and then people ask me, they're like, this is the stupidest thing. Why'd you do it? And I'm like, cause that's the only thing that ever breaks. <laughs> and that, they, they are everyone's favorite corner case. Um, so yeah, the, the main issue for us with stateful sets is they uh, they restart pods, but they keep the same name. Sure. Um, and Calico indexes some things off the name of the pod. Um, so we in this on this occasion we got confused between the old pod with the same name and the new pod with the same name. So we cleaned up the cleaned up the IP allocation for the new pod because the old pod was kind of terminating at the same time the new one was starting. Yeah, uh, the exa I think yeah. every CNI has had that bug, that exact bug yeah. where they cache the name of the damn container the wrong way. Like every, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we had that bug and we fixed that bug and it was fixed for a long time. Uh, and then I reintroduced that bug by, um, uh, with my work for the graceful termination stuff. Um, so yeah. Yeah, but now it's, it's yeah in addition to the, every CNI having that bug, there's they have there's probably some non-trivial recurrence of that bug every few months. That, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. Yeah, we like at this stage, like we really can't move away from naming our internal things by the name, but we wish we we wish we hadn't done that. But um it's uh do we need a better upstream test for this, Casey, you think? I... Like than the existing stateful tests? Well, uh, you never say no to better tests if we could catch this before it happens again. That would be great. Um, I mean, it's it's just one of those confusing things, right, where CNI declares its own set of indexes for data um, yeah. to make things unique. And Kubernetes is not CNI, so it has its own set of things that define uniqueness for an object and then you've got to to kind of reason about which ones to use in which places in order to um to do the right thing it's very tricky 
but this is not caught by the upstream test, this specific reboot bug. Uh, I'm not aware of one that, that does. Don't think so. Um, I have put in um, tests on our side now to, to um, spot that. that yeah, we'll if it happens again. Yeah, we we'll rebooted the VMs. Yeah. Well, actually, I think someone worked on that as well. Can't remember which which one the two of us fixed, but we both both worked on those. Are those um, do you know if those are unit tests or those end to ends? Uh, they are kind of end to end tests in the CNI plugin repo, I think. I think it's where I pop those. Yeah, but they're not built in the like. Kubernetes end to end framework. No, no, it'd be really good to have end to ends that test these corner cases. But it's kind of it's corner cases where your connectivity drops early, like during your graceful termination window, but only if that pod has been restarted with the same name. But it's it's that kind of level of fiddliness of test. Um, so yeah, have, having su having such tests would be fantastic. It would be tagged as disruptive and nobody would run them. Yeah. <laughs> so like it's over. It's a non-star. <laughs> yeah. I I think it'd be really nice if we had better support for stateful sets. Uh it's one of the things that comes up from time to time. Um, like allocating the same IP always to the first member of a stateful set and that kind of thing. Um but it requires IP borrowing in our IPAM to be turned on, and we've recently turned that off by default, so. <laughs> yeah. Can't have it all. Yeah, but yeah, I agree, like, we could probably do some cool stuff around stateful sets, like with a particular integration for them. Let's have to think about that some more. Um, so I've got a, a demo I can show. Um, so why don't I share my terminal window? Um, this should be pretty quick. Can you guys all see this terminal pretty well? Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'm going to show some of the service policy stuff that we did in um, in 320. Uh, it's pretty basic demo. Uh, I've got a cluster set up with an Nginx pod running, um, and then two other pods, one called access, one called no access. Um, Nginx is behind the service. So I should be able to curl it in both my access pod, which is this terminal up in the top left. Um, and then also in this no access pod in the top right. And that's because I've got no policies on the cluster at the moment. Um, what I've done is I've created uh, a few policies in here. So the first one I want to show is this global deny API server. Um, so I want to say right now that unless explicitly um, allowed, pods shouldn't be able to talk to the API server, just as you know, a matter of uh, least privilege. Um, so I built this egress policy. Um, that includes a deny rule, um, and it has this new match type in the destination, which is uh, these three lines. Um, and you can see it matches on the service with the name Kubernetes and the default namespace. Um, and then you know, for the demo, it allows everything else. Uh, so if I can spell create properly, uh, I can create this global deny to the API server. Um, I should still be able to hit Nginx on all these guys. Um, but if I try to hit the 
uh, Kubernetes API server. Those aren't going to work. Which is what I want. Um, now, uh, the next thing I want to do is I have a pod that I know needs access to the Kubernetes API server. So I'm going to uh, create a policy specifically that selects um, the access pod and then allows access to the Kubernetes API server. Um, and as you can see, it's using that same kind of service match syntax, which is a, a new thing added in 320. Uh, so I'm going to create that one. Uh, and now that I do that, I should see that my um, access pod is able to hit the API server. We're getting a forbidden error because I'm not passing any credentials. But um, if I try to do that from no access, it still can't hit that, um, uh, hit the API server. Uh, so what's kind of nice about this is that it was, um, and why I chose to use the API server for this demo is that it was kind of historically tricky to do because the API server is usually backed by host network pods that, um, you know, one or more across different nodes. Um, and uh, that makes it sort of tricky to do with, um, you know, the, the network policy primitives that have existed in previous releases. Um, I think normally that would be done with uh, a whitelisting, like specific IP addresses. Um, but in 320, you can use this service match uh, syntax to, um, tell Calico to uh, monitor the endpoints in that service and allow it to those. So even as API servers come and go, if you're doing rolling updates or adding or removing API server nodes, um, we'll keep that policy up to date. Um, I think that's, that's sort of it. I think that gets the idea. Um, any questions? What if I casually just did something like three lines of policy that used to be a complete pain in the bum and we got asked every uh, every week on Calico users about? Yeah, even while writing this, it wasn't until I got to this like try it out stage and it worked that I was like, oh my God, this is so convenient. <laughs> uh, is it marked in the docs that it only works on 320 and above? <laughs> Uh, probably not in such clear terms. Um, so I shared it for API server. You can do the same thing with, um, you know, in like services backed by pods too. So here's another one that might be interesting for a lot of people is um, allowing to keep DNS. I think that's another one that is uh, it's a little tricky. And maybe what, what isn't clear here, right, is that um, these three lines of policy end up rendering ports as well. So you don't need to keep your policy in sync with the ports that you're exposing on your pods. Um, if you look at the rules that are actually rendered for this, they will, um, include all the ports that, uh, the cube DNS service is available on at all of the locations that um, it's it's available. So uh, makes it real easy to keep your policy in sync with the actual application that's that's running. I think you just like obviated the need for like any of the existing network policies that, people, that like most people use. Yeah, I don't know if it completely obviates it, but it certainly is um, pretty pretty clean for, for some use cases. 
So I'm hoping uh, hoping people can get a lot of value out of this. Uh, in 320 right now, it's just egress policy, um, sort of as the first step, but we'll be uh, doing some additional um, work. So I think we'll, we'll definitely be adding ingress in 321. Is that a weird, weird corner case, the whole ports and points thing where you have to put the specific, like, so, so it, I, oh, I guess it's probably by default, but if you want, you can specify which service ports you actually care about probably, right? Um, yeah, so when you, I mean, when you launch uh, pods in a, a service, right, like Kubernetes has this whole um, layering of, Ports. So the, the pods have their container ports specified, and then services have their own ports, which can map to another port on the on the container. And usually that's the same. So you'll map port 80 on the service to port 80 on a container, but you could remap that in theory, and you could also have it mapped in multiple ways. So you could have a service with five pods, each serving on a different port, but the service remaps the port based on which endpoint it's sending to. Um, and so while that's a pretty rare case, if you are doing that, it makes it pretty rough to write policy for. Um, you know, one example of that is if you're doing like a canary build, for example, where the new version of the app exposes a different port than the old. Um, is sort of the, the typical example there. Um, and then you would need to write a canary policy and a non-canary policy and uh, keep those in sync. Whereas this, it just sort of learns the ports from the actual pod definition via the endpoint slice API uh, and will do the right thing. I guess you could, you could put a port match on the same rule, um, but you'd have to be aware that it was in terms of the pod ports rather than the service ports. Yeah, I think I think um, right now our validation prevents you doing that because it right. um, kind of says if you're using a service match, that's that's how you want to do it. You don't want to also mix in container ports and namespace selectors and all that stuff. And um, so you'll be prevented from doing something that maybe doesn't work the way you expect it to. Okay, so it's 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 meant the API is meant to be used, not at a super super fine grain, but as a service policy, which makes sense. Yeah, it's I mean when you match on the service, the service includes the protocol, the, whole, the port, yeah. the you know all the stuff that you would otherwise be specifying in the policy rule itself. Um, some so weirdo's gonna ask you for some weird hybrid policy that matches part of the service. I'm just like warning you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm ready for it, I think. Well, this is really cool, yeah. Uh, cool. Well, if there, are, if there are any other questions on that or or anything, we've got a few minutes to chat through them. If not, then uh, I think we're at the end, and I'll uh, just say thanks everybody for coming. We'll have this again in September on the second Wednesday, which looks like it's the eighth. So I'll see you all then. Take care, folks. Hope your trees are getting well for you. That gets <laughs> Thanks, yeah, first thing I'm doing is going outside to see how it looks. <laughs> and if you dropped a branch on your car. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I don't have one of those. Cheers, yeah. guys. Bye, everybody.